All righty, everybody. Happy, happy Thursday or no, Wednesday night. <laughs> We're not used to this. We are so excited to have everybody here. Welcome everyone to our first online salsa dance class with the great professor, Dr. Sarita. Renata, Renata, what are, what are you doing? What it's do you Dr. Mean? Zaghi. It's Dr. Yeah. Zaghi. I thought it was salsa night. No, no, it's Dr. Zaghi. Pay attention. Isn't he like the best salsa dancer though? I heard that. I heard that. Okay, was it about <laughs> sleep tonight? I'm sorry. All right, we're going to be talking about sleep. So there you tonight, go. <laughs> tonight's topic is six red flags behind the scenes on the research for sleep disordered breathing. But let me tell you guys a little bit about Dr. Zaghi first, just in case you do not know who he is. Dr. Zaghi graduated from Harvard Medical School, completed a residency in ENT at UCLA and sleep surgery okay. fellowship at yeah. Stanford University. The focus of his subspecialty training. No, those people are live, but they don't see a hundred. <laughs> hey guys, we can hear y'all. Uh, where was I? Sleep Surgery Fellowship at Stanford University. And now my computer shut off. Okay. The focus of his subspecialty training is on the comprehensive treatment of tongue tie, nasal obstruction, mouth breathing, snoring, and obstructive sleep apnea. He's very active in clinical research relating to sleep disorder breathing with over 80 peer reviewed research publications in the fields of neuroscience, head and neck surgery and sleep disordered breathing. I'm gonna keep going because this is important. Dr. Zag is particularly interested in studying the impact of tethered oral tissues such as tongue tie and oral myofascial dysfunction on maxillofacial development, upper airway resistance syndrome and obstructive sleep apnea. He's an invited lecturer, author, and journal reviewer for topics relating to the diagnosis and management of sleep disorder breathing and tongue tie disorders. And I love the statement that you have. I uh, chose one of them, and it's realize that your attitude determines your altitude and that you can do anything you set your mind to. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Renata, Lael, and all 100 participants who've joined us on Zoom and more on Facebook and uh, Clubhouse. So excited to be here with you. First of all, just wanted to congratulate you on this amazing mission that you're doing uh, to promote education in this space. Uh, so thank you for that great introduction. I am Saroosh Zaghi, Medical Director of the Breathe Institute, and I'm so uh, proud to be uh, in a role where I spend about half my time in patient care and the other half in research and education. And based on my background at Harvard, Stanford, and UCLA, we've learned to take a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and so it's so fantastic that every time we have conferences, we have uh, individuals and providers from all different backgrounds because that's really how we can learn to help our patients. And when people ask me why breathe, why the Breathe Institute, my answer is, for breath is life. And if you breathe well, you will live long on earth. And really, I, I think that Airway Circle epitomizes this very same mission to help people breathe well. And we appreciate that we want all patients to breathe well, sleep well, and function well. And in order to optimize this for all patients, what we have to do is not only solve a problem when it presents itself to us, but even more so, we have to play an active role in prevention and early identification, which brings us to the topic uh, of developing the Ferris Six so that we can identify these red flags early on. One of the red flags for obstructive sleep disorder breathing is actually mouth breathing. And mouth breathing is already on the continuum of the spectrum of obstructive sleep disorder breathing. Here we have a little girl with low tongue posture, not due to tongue tie, but to, due to other issues. And over the course of six months, she develops habitual mouth breathing. And the mouth breathing 
leads to noisy breathing. And the noisy breathing leads to sleep apnea. And it's um, so difficult to see our children struggling, but they struggle and they compensate and they struggle and they compensate and they, until they no longer can handle the burden of the obstructive sleep disorder breathing. So here in this one example, we're seeing how a young baby with issues that were unrecognized progressed on to more and more severe uh, presentations of obstructive sleep disordered breathing. Whereas maybe five, 10 years ago, all the focus was on sleep apnea and the harmful effects of sleep apnea. Today, we recognize that in addition to sleep apnea, we're also concerned about obstructive sleep disordered breathing. And obstructive sleep disordered breathing includes mouth breathing, upper airway resistance, and snoring. And the recent studies show that in 10,000 pre-adolescents, those patients who had obstructive sleep disorder breathing without sleep apnea, just the mouth breathing, noisy breathing, and snoring had alterations of brain growth. They had significantly smaller volumes of multiple frontal lobe regions. And we've learned that these problems with compromised airways are often the root cause for a host of issues that our children will present. All of this reinforces the fact that we want to identify these issues when there's smoke, because the smoke precedes the fire of the complications that ensue. And to that extent, we want all of our patients to breathe well, sleep well, and function well. There are things that we can do. For example, treating tongue ties and lip ties in myofunctional therapy. And so here's an adorable three-year-old who has a tongue tie, causing her to have low tongue posture. And with simple treatments, we're able to dramatically alter the trajectory of her entire life. But it's important to recognize that tongue tie is only one aspect. And when we're talking about a functional approach to growth and development, we have to think even beyond tongue tie about the way that our children are feeding their habits, food, environmental issues, body posture, and more. And the question comes up, how do we get more ENTs involved? How do, we, how do we get more ENTs? Why can't the ENT step up to the bat? And the truth is, is that there are only about 1,000 pediatric ENTs in this country. In the United States, there are only 10,800 board certified ENTs. And unfortunately, at least half of them are in cosmetics and aesthetics, facial plastics. So that leaves a really small pool for, of ENTs to serve our population. That would mean that each ENT would have to take care of 74,000 children. And so that's why we're not directly speaking to the ENTs. The ENTs are one part of the team, but what we really need as the quarterbacks of the team are you guys here in the audience, you guys who are taking time from your busy schedules to come and learn how we can all be part of this interdisciplinary healthcare team. We need all hands on deck for this epidemic of sleep disordered breathing that can range from one to 2% of patients who suffer from sleep apnea, but up to 25 to 50% of the children who have problems with habitual mouth breathing. And to facilitate this early identification, we have developed the FARA-6. We're so proud the FARA-6 has now been published in the Journal of Pediatric Dentistry and will be part of the AAPD guidelines for all pediatric dentists. And so there are six simple things that we look for, and we'll go through one by one. And we recognize that this was at least five to 10 years in the making, okay, to come up with these six factors. And I'll be giving you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what it took to get to this point where we have six 
easy, readily identifiable phenotypes and characteristics that individuals in our communities, preschool teachers, grocery store clerks, librarians, anybody, especially those in the dental community, dental assistants, dental hygienists, speech therapists, school nurses, everybody can look for these six things and help us identify those children who need our help the most, those children who we can help guide and mold for optimal sleep, breathing, and airway health. And so among these six things, we have mouth breathing, mentalis strain, tonsil hypertrophy, ankyloglossia, dental wear, and narrow palate. And our research shows that these factors are synergistic as red flags. You ideally, to be in the normal range, you wouldn't have any of these factors. But if you start to say yes to one or two, you're already in the mild spectrum of obstructive sleep disorder breathing. Three or four puts you in the moderate, and five to six puts you in the likely severe range. This is a wide success because we can now identify pediatric obstructive sleep disordered breathing without the use of questionnaires that depend on the parents to know whether there is a problem. We can now identify obstructive sleep disordered breathing without expensive tools such as in-lab sleep studies. And so we're really proud that this is the way forward that we're going to use to screen individuals and get them the help that they need. And in this screening tool, really breathing is the beginning. And so the first thing we want to know is whether the patient can breathe through their nose. And so I'll, you keep in mind that the Ferris 6, while it has been validated in the pediatric mixed dentition, about six, ages 6 to 13, it can really be used for all patients, but we're most interested in this population of the pre-adolescence before puberty because we really want to get them on track before they hit puberty. Because that the way they're going, growing before, right before puberty is so predictive of where they will end up through puberty. So it's so, so important to make sure that we identify these issues and keep them on track through these critical ages of development. Of course, we can also help teenagers, adults, and even 70 and 80 year old patients. But how much uh, more worthwhile and rewarding to be able to pick up these issues? In early, uh, in early childhood. So the first test is to see, can the individual breathe through their nose for three minutes? And what we do is a three minute lip seal test. You just try, you put something between the lips, whether it's a piece of tape, a tongue depressor, piece of paper, or have them hold water between their lips, inside their mouth, and you see, can you breathe for three minutes? Yes or no. The next thing we look at is while they're breathing, whether or not they present with what's called mentalis strain. You can see that on the boy on the left, this is our twins. He's a nasal breather and he breathes comfortably with his lips together. Whereas the child on the right, you see that he's straining to keep his lips together. We have learned that mentalis strain is an indicator for altered facial growth. Sometimes it can be vertical growth resulting in a gummy smile. Other times it can be retrognathic mandible and underdevelopment of the entire facial complex. So we look for the mentalis strain. It's an indicator of oral incompetence, uh, lip ties, weakness in the lips, as well as uh, skeletal changes. The next thing that we look at is tonsil hypertrophy. And again, all of these are easy to learn by the folks in our community. We look to see whether or not Deep inside the throat, we're able to visualize the tonsils. And ideally, you wouldn't really see the tonsils. And if you do, they won't be significantly obstructing the airway as we see in this figure. In this figure, we see that the tonsils are occupying more than 75% of the airway and contributing to an acute and severe airway obstruction. The fourth factor that we look for is whether or not the patient has adequate tongue mobility. Can the patient lift up their tongue? Can they lift up the front of the tongue? And can they lift up the back of the tongue? 
And this has been a lot of work in progress. And we're so excited that we finally have a tool for pediatric sleep disorder breathing that accurately looks at the tongue function, both the anterior and posterior tongue mobility. We also look for signs of dental wear. We have published separately that dental wear is, is often associated with obstructive sleep disordered breathing. It can be associated with nasal obstruction, large tonsils, and tongue tie. But independently, dental wear is a significant risk factor for obstructive sleep disorder breathing. And finally, whether they have a high arch, narrow palate, or dental crowding. So again, this has just got published here in 2021, but I thought I'd take a little step back, give you a behind the scenes look at how I got involved in this and how some of my collaborators uh, worked to inspire us. So I graduated from Harvard Medical School, can't believe it, in 2010. I was a student there from 2006 to 2010, and it's at Harvard Medical School on this campus where I got inspired to pursue research. I published 15 articles. I graduated six months early, so I finished in three and a half years with 15 publications. And uh, the lessons that I learned here was that it's not about what's in the textbooks, it's about the way that you interpret that information and that you research, you constantly research so that we can advance these textbooks and produce the knowledge of the future. And so it makes me so proud as an alumnus of this medical school uh, to go back after we've published many articles and made these seminal uh, investigations uh, to help pursue the field forward. And I thought I'd give you guys a little look uh, during my recent trip there about 10 years later. I came to interview here and I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is like where I have to get in here. I have to go to medical school here. Like, yeah. I saw like my whole future like unfold. Uh, and when I got in, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It's crazy to be here. Pretty chill. Uh, I got I got the financial aid application before I got the, the actual admittance, yeah. and they said if you get the financial aid like application, that means you're probably in. So I checked some like student doctor forums, and then I still didn't do anything. But then the acceptance came. I screamed, I yelled, <laughs> like emailed everyone I knew, like caps. I got into Harvard Medical School! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Uh, 2006 to 2010, so four years. Okay, yeah. wow. I finished in three and a half. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> of course you did. Yeah. I finished in three and a half. I had 15 publications. We got into UCLA, wow. uh, ENT residency, so and it was good. right there at Boston Children's. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital is where I became inspired to become an ENT. The first two years I was into neuroscience. I was publishing. I was really into it. Uh, I did one rotation in neurosurgery. The next month I did Children's Hospital Boston, and it brought me so much life. That's, that's where I did my first teaching. Uh, I saw my first hospital action there. Yeah. My first Because yeah. it was there where they would do simple interventions on these like little kids and then just like dramatically improve the quality of their life. Uh, and they had specialists from like all kinds of disciplines. I was like, this is this is for me. This this is what I want to do. Like, I remember like like when I was doing my rotations, like 2008, 2009. Like I would be so nervous to present like one case, and like I would study so hard. I would be up like at 5 a.m. until like midnight, 1 uh, 1 a.m. sometimes working on my research project, uh, and like all the work that went into something. And then uh, now it's just like. Like another publication, another publication, yeah. and this just kind of comes yeah. off, and like like a presentation here, a presentation there, like yeah, no problem. Yeah. You like speak on this, like yeah, yeah sure. Like... It's humbling. It's humbling, and it and it, it really makes you kind of uh, take a step back and recognize that each individual, like in each window of this building, and what they do to contribute to medicine as we know it today, 
And when we're lecturing about tongue tie recognize it's really just one piece of the puzzle. It's just one piece of the puzzle. And there's it's like a it's like a vast ocean here. It's like from children to adults, and, and it was just like like ears, nose, throat, breathing, it was medical, it was surgical. Everyone did well. Uh, and I'm so lucky to be inspired by all the great uh, doctors and surgeons there. And who knew that I could come back 10 years later to contribute uh, in my own small ways. Hope you guys enjoyed that little tour back. But really, I bring that because it's really in medical school on the first day that my, uh, the dean of the medical school, and just the whole essence, I just want you guys to feel what it's like to be on that campus there. The history, if you like take a look at every window there, there's researchers in each window who are sitting there pipetting, researching like new ideas. And if you think of like all the history and all the innovation that's done, the only way that you can do innovation is by admitting that you don't have all the answers. The only way that you can do research, the only way that you can learn is by, is by introducing humility and recognizing that half of what you've learned, that half of what you know may be true, but the other half, we have to go and relearn and research. okay? And so that's why research is a critical element of my practice. I really couldn't have the practice the way that I do without the research. I think every year my practice evolves, it grows, and um, I'm so, so excited to be part of this field. My introduction to sleep surgery and breathing was as early as 2013. This was in my third year of residency. Uh, in my third year of residency, I got accepted two years early into the Stanford Sleep Surgery Fellowship. So while I was in residency and I hadn't even graduated, I made a commitment that I wouldn't apply anywhere else uh, if, and, they, and they accepted me. So since I got in two years early, I really focused my entire uh, ENT training on sleep and breathing. I kind of ignored all the other things. Uh, I still participated, but I didn't, I didn't do as much in like ears, for example. I kind of skipped out and I was really focused on breathing, airway, and I was really lucky to kind of know early on. And the other fortunate part was my introduction to Dr. Macario Camacho. Dr. Macario Camacho is a huge force in research for sleep disorder breathing. And I don't think he gets enough credit uh, to what she deserves. Uh, so he has written probably 50 systematic reviews and meta-analysis and has inspired so many people. Um, uh, Matt Camacho, as we call him, is uh, is chief of surgery at Tripler Army Medical Center, uh, and he covers one third of the uh, military hospitals. And I have so much respect for him that uh, even though he's a sleep surgeon, even though he's a researcher, uh, during the uh, Afghan and Iraq War, he did two tours of duty. He left his his four kids at home uh, to go and truly serve. Uh, serve the country because they needed people uh, with medical expertise. So this is an individual who just doesn't get the credit that he deserves. And really, it's because of Matt Camacho that I was able to get into this field. So in 2014, I met Mac during my interview there. He helped to accept me into the program. And he said, I see you. You've done some research. Let's work together. I said, yes, sure, whatever. Whatever you want, I'm in. So he said, there's this thing called myofunctional therapy. I'd never heard the word. And they said, he said that there's some debate on this topic. There's some doctors who really go for it, who really believe in it. And there's a lot of doctors who don't. There was one doctor who went for it. Do you guys know who that is? Who was really pushing it. It's all he could talk about. Do you guys know who that is? Any guesses? Anybody want to guess? Go for it, you. No, so I was a student, so I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything, right? Come this is on. my introduction. One of the biggest. Right. There was one. Things. It was Doctor Christian Gimino. Yes. Okay. So over the last ten years of his life, uh, he got he got the myofunctional therapy bug, just like all of you do. He just couldn't get enough of it. So everywhere he would go, he would talk about this. He'd be like, "You guys, you're wasting your time with CPAP. You guys are wasting your time with surgery." myofunctional therapy. 
And some of the doctors, they just got like so annoyed that they're like, let's just do a study and prove that there's no such thing as myofunctional therapy. So you'll see that Dr. Gimino is not one of the authors on this paper. This paper was written to spite Dr. Guillemino, okay? Doc, and, but it's interesting because the results of this paper confirmed his hypothesis that myofunctional therapy could reduce the apnea hypopnea index by over 50% and actually prevent sleep apnea in young children, okay? So that was my first introduction, and I had a little bit of exposure to myofunctional therapy even even during my residency before I graduated. I graduated in 2015, and then I enrolled as a fellow at Stanford, where I got to meet the very Christian Guillermino himself. And when you're there, I'll tell you that it's very interesting. You would think that everybody would get up and respect this man who invented the term obstructive sleep apnea, UARS, but there was Huge politics there, huge politics. He got more and more siloed and cornered and pulled. His office got kept moving away from the residents. He had less time with the residents. People would warn you, hey, be careful. I actually got a phone call from, from a sleep surgeon who is now was very antagonistic to my function. He said, hey, Saroosh, just want to give you a heads up. Watch out for CG. Watch out. He's not, you know, he, he took a sharp turn and, you know, be careful when you talk to him. But, you know, me, I, I found that intriguing. I would sit with him right here in this room during my breaks, just pick his mind. He was like a wealth of information. He knew all the literature. He was so sound and so compassionate and really cared for his patients. And so we were talking and he was doing a paper on tongue tie as it may be a predictor of sleep apnea. And he said, hey, why don't you run the statistics for this? I said, yeah, sure, okay. And so this was the first, this was one of the first papers I did with him on tongue ties. I had published with him on other topics before that. And uh, the results were impressive, right? I mean, it was so incredible to see uh, the data that we collected confirmed his hypothesis. And you know, he's always right. I go back and I pulled up some of his old emails uh, from years ago in preparation for this talk. And some of the things he was talking about even five years ago, I didn't understand. He was talking about CO2 levels five, six years ago and, and, and uh, breath holding. And we were, I just wasn't there yet in my, in my development. But going back and reading some of his comments and reading some of his literature has re-inspired me uh, down this path. And I'm also really grateful to two of my colleagues this is uh, Dr. Stanley Liu and Audrey Yoon. They were uh, pivotal, critical as my partners and uh, mentors. They were my mentors who they showed ultimate respect for Dr. Guillermo. Ultimate respect, okay? I mean, Stanley Liu had MMA surgery scheduled, right? He had like two MMA surgeries scheduled for the day. That's MMA is a long surgery, the four to six hour surgery. It's tough. But CG would say, I want you to postpone your MMA and release this tongue tie first thing in the morning. Stanley Liu wouldn't question it. He wouldn't question it. He said, whatever CG says goes, okay? So we would do one, two, three tongue ties first, and then we would do the MMAs. And that's because of the respect that Stanley had for, for Dr. Guillemino, and that rubbed up on me as well. And Audrey, Audrey was super close to Dr. Guillemino, uh, visiting him uh, like weekly, uh, even in his, in his last days. Uh, you know, and so it's with that uh, kind of approach and early learning that I wanted to become an academic physician, but at the same time, recognize the politics behind the scenes. OK, there's a lot of politics in academia uh, and I, I just wanted to be completely free to pursue my research interests. So I took a leap of faith. I met my partners, Laylee and Chad. And we developed the Breathe Institute. And the Breathe Institute is a place where individuals can come from different backgrounds to honor the legacy of Dr. Guillaume you know, in terms of continually making a commitment to continuing education, learning for the field of sleep and breathing. And it's so amazing to see the growth of our department and all of the amazing work we were able to accomplish 
through research. And one of the most pivotal research articles that we did that really took this field to another level was our 2019 paper, Lingual Frenuloplasty with Myofunctional Therapy, the first paper to actually demonstrate safety and efficacy of tongue tie surgery with myofunctional therapy. And you can see that Dr. Guillemino, Stanley, and Audrey are co-authors, in addition to Matt Camacho and others who taught me a lot about myofunctional therapy, including Joy Moeller, Valerie Sinkis, Rebecca Thorson, Virginia Downing, Dr. Hang, and Dr. Hockel. So the article showed that uh, lingual frenuloplasty can help. We take it for granted now. We didn't know this five years ago, that lingual frenuloplasty can help with mouth breathing, that it could help with muscle tension, snoring, and clenching. But the good thing is this article also taught us that it's not just about tongue tie. It's also about tongue tone and tongue space. What we've learned that tongue tie, treating tongue ties in isolation just doesn't work. You need to be supported with adequate tongue tone and tongue space. So even before I got into this picture, I think it's important to recognize that I was able to stand on the shoulder of giants to take this project across the finish line. But really, we are so indebted to Dr. Christian Guillemino, who founded the Association of Sleep Disorders in 1975, who published over 600 peer-reviewed medical journal articles, and who really spent the last 10 years of his life lighting the candles and inspiring doctors like myself, Dr. Yun and Dr. Liu, uh, to pursue research in this area. Here is a picture from his office where you can see the seminal contributions that he made. This was an early sleep study uh, that they actually developed. And, uh, and really, it's incredible to think that this is the man who came up with the term obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, the man who discovered the term upper airway resistance syndrome. He is the first to publish the presence of sleep apnea in children. He was the first to publish that, and he published it with a case series. Dr. Guillem, you know, a lot of his work was just case reports and case series, but was able to make a huge impact. And at that time, 1976, they learned that by removing the tonsils and adenoids, you can dramatically help improve the quality of life of these children. And from there, it took many years for them to recognize that tonsillectomy alone was not the answer. Because as early as 2004, Dr. Gimino reported that whereas 85% of children might do okay after tonsillectomy, there was at least 15% of kids who would not get better with adenoid and tonsil remover, removal. So he went to different conferences, he, made, he met uh, different orthodontists, including Stacy Quo, and they discovered that a lot of these kids, in addition to the large tonsils and adenoids, and sometimes without it, they had this thing called the high arch narrow palate. And so in 2011, in 2011 was the first time that they actually published in a medical journal of sleep and breathing that in fact, changes to the maxillary arch can affect the way that these children are breathing, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose. And from there, they learned that you could treat this with adenoidectomy and orthodontics. But if you don't follow it up with myofunctional therapy, they're almost of no use at all. The kids will relapse and fall back into problems with sleep disorder breathing. And it was since 2013, that very time when I got into Stanford, right? It was 2013 that I was accepted. Dr. Gimino just published this and he was ranting about myofunctional therapy. And he made the bold statement that we want our kids breathing through their nose all the time. Think about this. Think about how we take this for granted now, that we want nasal breathing as the ultimate goal. Just seven years ago, in 2015 is when the meta-analysis was published, not refuting, but supporting his observation that in fact, 
Myofunctional therapy reduces the apnea hypopnea index by 50% in adults and 62% in children, effective for children and adults of all ages, three years to 79. And it's from there that we recognize that there's some individuals with problems with the tongue tie who simply can't do the myofunctional therapy. And we drew our attention to tongue tie release. It took almost two years, 20 revisions to get the paper right. I'm sure that everyone has now seen this paper and been exposed to its magnificent uh, impacts. But you may not know that on the day that this article was published, July 9, 2019, I received congratulations from everyone except one person. And it's on that same day that this article was published that we said goodbye to Dr. Christian Gimino. If we can recognize the problem behind the development of abnormal breathing during sleep, uh, we may be able to treat this element and eliminate the development of adult obstructive sleep apnea. I believe that the head of the orchestra is the sleep medicine specialist, knowledgeable in sleep medicine, but he need the help of all the other, or the orchestra, to uh, do a good diagnostic and a good treatment. And that's uh, behind the idea of a multidisciplinary clinic where, you know, every patient, and the younger the patient, the more difficult it is, every patient is a bit different. That's one of the advantage of a multidisciplinary clinic is because you have for one patient, multiple ex, uh, expertise which are available and where the patient learn one medical act is only part of a journey. And it's so, uh, it's so meaningful to finally have now the Ferris Six, because the Ferris Six is a multidisciplinary tool where individuals from different backgrounds can all come to the table together to help identify these issues early on so that we can get these kids the help they need before it's too late. And so Dr. Guillemino was part of this as early as 2017. He was on the planning committee for the functional orofacial screening tool. He's the one who told us about tongue up to the palate and LPS. And even though we call them different things now to make it more palatable, uh, we can see that, that, you know, I just go back and I pull up some of these emails. Uh, he was talking about increase in sympathetic activity in some of his emails, increase in CO2 levels. And even though we don't have him here with us today, we can still learn from him by reading his research papers and going through his emails and uh, continuing on his legacy. His legacy is one of not only doing research, but putting that research into action. And I know that he would be proud of what we're doing with Breathe Babies and Kids, taking a look early on, as early as birth, to help them develop optimal oral sensory motor feeding habits, growth and development, recognizing that breath is life, breathing is simple, but breathing is also complex. And really, if there's one message that I've learned from Dr. Gimno is to always keep learning. And I know that he would be very proud of what you guys are doing here at Airway Circle to promote the education in this space and provide a forum where, where individuals from all backgrounds can come together to learn and discuss uh, and to research for the truth. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I'll get some comments and then I'll go for the Q&A. Dr. Zaghi, you turned us around. <laughs> You're not supposed to make me cry, oh my gosh. Lyle, do you have anything to say? 
<laughs> I need to compose myself. Uh, I know that that was so that was amazing. First, your video made me cry, and then his video <laughs> made me cry. And every, is everybody here crying? Oh. Comment if you're crying oh and my feel gosh. inspired because that's how you should feel right now. Definitely, you're here, even if you're 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 not even practicing myofunctional therapist. Maybe you are just. Uh, not just right. Uh, maybe you're a, a dental hygienist. Maybe you're a speech language pathologist, and are an OT, airway circle. We rec- we have everybody here. Um, you can't feel not a little bit inspired to to Any- do something. Anyways, I think that you have answered every single one of our questions. <laughs> and you know, my last question to Dr. Zaghi was going to be, "What do you think, Dr. Gimeno?" would want us all to know what would he say right now and he just answered it so (laughs) thank you so much for uh, putting this together for us you are incredible thanks for inspiring every single one of us to do what we do Uh, absolutely I'm so proud of you guys it's it's incredible 100 people on the line here we actually we actually have about 200 I've been counting how many do you have? 200. 200 people. So, so look at the amazing audience that you have here, Renata and Lael. You're doing really good. You're giving, uh, you're giving an, uh, a forum for people from different backgrounds. The most incredible thing about this group is that it's multidisciplinary. I bet if you took a poll, you would see that they have doctors in this group. You have hygienists. I know you have community members. And it's so amazing that we're welcoming community members, parents, patients, uh, because it's really through them that we that we that we learn about these things. There was a few other questions that I missed. So one one person asked about uh, the age at which tonsils can be removed, and so the safest age at which tonsils can be removed is above age three. Under age three, they can still be removed, but it requires an inpatient hospital stay. Under age two, like one years old, it gets more and more complex and risky. So the ideal age is above age three. I know that another individual, I think Shirley had a question about doing tongue tie releases in patients with connective tissue disorders. And so in that regard, we keep in mind that tongue tie releases for patients with tight frenula and Marfan and connective tissue disorders are generally loose. And you generally want to um, maybe avoid or think twice before doing a tongue tie release on those patients. Um, I think I got all the other questions. Uh, happy to stay on the line if there's any other questions, but I hope you guys are all feeling inspired to continue learning, that you guys uh, appreciate that a lot of work goes into these research publications that we that we put out there. Uh, and uh, we hope that you'll will be our partners in spreading this to the community. Uh, the best way to honor uh, Dr. Guillaume no is to carry forward the product of his work. Uh, and to go in whatever way that you're going to, to either implement these tools or contribute to the research in your own way. Definitely. There were a couple other questions that came through on Instagram this week. Um, one was asking um, if sleep disordered breathing could be, can be caused by allergies alone or um, does it improve if the allergies are addressed? Absolutely. So, so when you have allergies, allergies contribute to inflammation, okay? And the inflammation can actually inflame uh, the lining inside the note and inside the throat. And as you get inflammation there, you get swelling, and the swelling can cause airway obstruction. As you reduce that inflammation by removing the allergens, working on the nasal breathing, changing the diet, you will be able to reduce the swelling and actually open up the airway. So absolutely, uh, the allergies can certainly be a trigger. Uh, It's that domino effect. Once you have the mouth breathing, you get alterations in tongue posture and facial growth and tonsil hypertrophy. So the earlier you act, the better. We also got several questions about um, lip and buckle ties. That's great. So actually with, with Audrey Yoon and others, we're actually looking at a revised grading scale for, for lip, lip ties. Uh, lip ties are extraordinarily controversial. It's very difficult to publish in this area. Uh, Dr. Baxter has a series of 100 very severely lip tie patients who had a diastema and he released them. The diastema closed within six months or to a year. Uh, and it's very difficult to publish in this space, but... We are developing very high level studies 
Uh, the studies have to be done longitudinally, longitudinally over several years because there's some thought that the attachment changes over time. So what's a liptide before age six can actually migrate up and no longer be, an, be a liptide uh, by the time they reach puberty. So uh, a lot more research needs to be done on liptides and we, uh, we are going to be taking a look at that. Okay, I think there is one more question. I'm just looking Some, back. Somebody just said, uh, what, where can we find the newest grading of functional tongue space? Uh, that, that's a work in progress. That's a work in progress. Uh, so, uh, it's not been published, but we're hopefully you guys can see these projects take one, two, three, four, five years to validate. Uh, so the first step in validating that study is we're, we're going to be publishing this year, a protocol for taking CBCT scans to measure airway. And we've shown that just a small head change in head angle by five degrees can alter the airway. So I need to publish that first. Then I get the CBCTs and the tongue space, uh, and then we publish that. So it takes time, and there's steps to getting there. Uh, Pat Pine asks, what is the <laughs> link of enlarged maxillary tori? Can it be removed yeah, so, for some more tongue room? Yeah. Tori were developed at the point of maximum tension, so depending on the way that the teeth are constructed. If you have a narrow palate and the forces are in the middle, the, the torus will develop in that area. It's there to buttress the bone and provide extra support. It's like a little callus. Uh, if the tension is on the mandible, you develop mandibular tori. Uh, so before you go ahead and remove it, you want to ask why. Why did it develop tori? Uh, the tori is providing some degree of support. Of course, if it's, a, if it's, if it's in the way, you could, you could remove it from more tongue room, but it's not typical to do that. And you can't remove it with CO2, no. Wow. It's actual bone. You have to drill it out. Very, very nice. Um, tonsil stones? Oh yeah, that tonsil was a great stones. question. Yeah, so tonsil stones, uh, so tonsils have crypts and valleys in them, and then food and bacteria can get trapped underneath, and you get a seal of inflammation. So it's like a multi-layered cake, right? If you know, it's like you have cake and you have filling, you have cake and you have filling. But I'll never look at cake the same yeah, way. <laughs> yeah, but with tonsils, but instead of cake, you have you have like bacteria and food, and it gets trapped. So at some point, you just got to take it all and just, just scrap it and start over fresh. Awesome. Um, it says the blood vessels dilate due to low oxygen. If no allergies are present, could a narrow nasal cavity, therefore low oxygen in itself, be a cause of enlarged turbinates? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the problem with pediatric disorder breathing rarely is low oxygen. Okay. The, the major finding is, is of the compensation, the effort to breathe. Uh, only one to 2% of children actually have sleep apnea and get low oxygen. The vast majority of the kids who have these issues, they compensate, sleep on their side, wake themselves up. So it's not actually a low oxygen problem. It's actually a sympathetic tone problem. And sympathetic tone, fight or flight response, adrenaline uh, can work in, in uh, varied ways throughout the body. Oof. Can you please touch on empty nose syndrome? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think with everything, you, th there needs to be balance, right? You don't want to be super tongue-tied. You don't want to be super loose, like with Marfan syndrome, for example, or connective tissue disorders. When you're creating space in the mouth, you don't want to go too wide. You don't want to be too small. It's just got to be the right fit. And the same goes for the nose. If the nose is too open, the air travels too quickly, and your body doesn't have a chance to warm or humidify that air. So when you breathe, you breathe in cold air, and it's actually, uh, and for patients who've had their turbinates removed, Nasal breathing is effectively just like mouth breathing uh, and they're hyperventilating and they don't have the ability to retain enough CO2. Well, do you want to ask the last one? Um, how do you do your lip and tongue tie releases? Yeah, so uh, we have demonstrations on our website, but I use a combination of scissors and laser. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps the hallmark of my approach is the use of myofunctional therapy before and after as well as sutures to promote primary intention healing. So if there's any other questions that um, people want to send in, you can always join um, the Airway Circle Facebook group. There's a lot of professionals in there. Like we were saying, um, we have a couple of different ENTs, orthodontists, um, you name it, they're in there. And you can ask these, these questions as well. Um, Dr. Zaghi, do you want to talk about some of the Breathe Institute, the different courses you guys offer? Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. So, uh, you know, for those who are interested in really like learning, like taking a deep dive and learning about all the research and everything that we talked about, we do offer courses through the Breed Institute. For those who are interested, uh, you can you can email courses at the Breed Institute uh, for information. Uh, we have courses ranging from my five day online course where I go through the entire scope of sleep and breathing to a Breathe Baby course where we're talking about oral sensory motor, my functional therapy courses through my own mentor and my own masterminds, uh, and and others. So those for those who are interested in learning with us, learning our protocols, how we do it really uh, in depth, we welcome you to reach out and we'd love to have you as one of our ambassadors. Yay, that is absolutely perfect. I think we're going to call the night, but I do want to invite everybody that's here tonight to please uh, join us on Area Circle. We have meetings like these um, three times a week. We have the Zooms on Thursday nights. Tomorrow we're off, by the way. Uh, Tuesday nights, we have clubhouse rooms. And then on Wednesday nights, we have Dr. Martha Cortez, who hosts a clubhouse room for us. She also brings speakers. And we have these incredible speakers from all over the world that come over here and um, donate their time to share all this amazing information um, with us. If you would like to become an Aries Circle member, it is only $25 a month and you get access to um, research folder, you get access to uh, product discounts, you get access to all of these recorded clubhouse meetings and Zoom meetings, and you get to be part of this uh, cool group. And we're always giving back and trying to find different ways. And we have a lot of projects coming up to uh, help spread the word and raise awareness on uh, airway issues. So thanks everybody for being here. Dr. Zaghi, you have been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for always supporting us. And um, we'll see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Keep up the great work. So proud of you all. And uh, everyone, have a great night and keep learning. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lionel. Thank you. Bye, guys.